Because I, you know, I, I couldn't read everything here. Uh, but there was a traumatic experience. I, I, I obviously wanted to uh, go there and uh, just uh, uh, to inspect uh, the passions uh, that this place uh, uh, had once housed, you know. I mean, I was born in that uh, house. I wanted to be there. I knocked on the door. This old man comes out uh, with a uh, uh, with a heavy uh, East European accent, and he asks me what I want. In Hebrew, I tell him, I, uh, you know, in Eng I ask him, do you speak English? And he goes, yes, I do. And uh, I say, look, I was wondering if you would mind uh, if I just looked around. He, of course, is uh, surprised by my strange, uh, bizarre request. So to edify him, I say, look, you know, I was born in this house. So he lets me in. Uh, and he says, you were born here and you don't speak Hebrew? I said, look, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, not a, I'm an Arab, I'm not a Jew. So he had arthritis, and I could tell his arthritic, <laughs> arthritic uh, attack uh, 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 was aggravating. Uh, and then I add, because he, uh, I got flustered, and I add, well, actually, like, you know, it's like, you know, I'm American, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm just, like, trying to visit. Uh, I'm just trying to check. Uh, but he, you could tell that he wants me out uh, of the house. Uh, I don't know whose house it was. It's my house, his house, our house, God damn it. It doesn't make a difference. He wanted me out of that house. And, uh, and that, in my view, uh, is a metaphor. The incident is a metaphor about the confrontation uh, between the Palestinians and the Israelis. He is a man who clearly, <coughs> pardon me, who clearly came from Eastern Europe, living in my house, the house that my parents or grandparents had actually built, where I was born, He's telling me to get the hell out of there uh, because it's now his house. Thank you, sir. So you are not warmly and cordially really received there? <laughs> uh, by this one particular man, I was not. Because, you see, what I did by knocking on his door and confronting him with my reality was to assault every conceivable political value that he had believed in as an Israeli or as a Zionist. Nevertheless, until he established that you could not speak Hebrew, he didn't know who you were. Uh, that's he true. He looked on your face, and you were just another person. Yeah. Perhaps someone just born in that house. But the very moment I identified myself as a Palestinian, my identity itself became an assault on his very senses. You on his political system. Did, did they know who you were when you went? I mean, uh, you went to buy in the airport, like at Led Matar Airport. Uh, well, obviously, when American I went... American cities, and how did they, you know, did you have any difficulties getting in? Or well, anybody they knew who searched you were? my ear earlobes. Sure. Uh, <laughs> but they had... So you're hearing much better. <laughs> as an American citizen, you didn't get any... Uh, well, I mean, obviously, they had to let me in because I'm an American, mm -hmm. you see. But your name was Phil. Uh, you know, I look as American as napalm. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> what do they say? As American as apple pie. Mm -hmm. I say as American as napalm. <laughs> you know? Uh, no, but uh, uh, clearly when I went through immigration, they, uh, uh, they uh, knew that I was a uh, Palestinian, though I was a naturalized American. And uh, anyone had the knowledge that you were a writer, who you are, you're for Western? Uh, no, they yeah. didn't know who I was then. I was just a nameless, faceless uh, American, Palestinian American, uh, visiting uh, Israel. That's what um, you think. Excuse me. That's what you think, probably. Well, yeah. where, where did you well, go? Uh, where did you go into uh, into so Israel? You, know you didn't yeah. cross the Jordan. You didn't go first into. No, I just I just uh, traveled all over Palestine, including okay. Israel, West Bank, Gaza. And you landed in Tel Aviv, right here. I landed in Tel Aviv, yes, yes. Habib, I'm sorry, I didn't get your question. I said that that's what you probably think, that you were uh, passing there as a incognito, but probably ears and eyes were yeah, on. Yeah, I, I have no doubt that uh, they punched, uh, you know, their computer and my name came up 
you know, this is a, a Palestinian well-known figure in the States, and he's anti-Israeli, and, and he's on the lecture and circuit. And he wants you to buy his book. And, and, and buy his yes, he wants selling well in Israel. <laughs> but you're selling well. Yes. Did you, that's a good question. Did it you take selling, your books? This is ironic. It is did you take Israel. your books with you, any of your books, or you went there? At the, uh, no, this book had not come book. out yet. In fact, okay, I you went... you had already two books prior... Uh, uh, yeah, I didn't take any books with me. I mean, oh, my okay. old books, I mean, no. Can I ask you, in your first reading, you, were, you referred to these people. Uh, I, I believe you were, you were in Haifa then. Right? Yeah, Israelis. Yeah. And um, I, I understand the frustration about all of the confusion that's going on that is not allowing the building of, of Palestine. But who are these people? Are these people inclusive of, of Palestinians and Israelis? Or, or who are these? I mean, when I, I said these people in Haifa, Haifa is now uh, uh, almost an exclusively Jewish city. So when I said these people, I meant Israelis. So uh, I was essentially talking. Um, if, you see, if if you had read this chapter from the outset, you would know that I'm actually referring to exclusively Israelis, okay. not other people, just Israelis. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience when you went to? I think it was Jericho when you were staying at an apartment, a friend's apartment, and your friend was caught in a curfew somewhere else in a different city, and he couldn't come to see you for three days. That's true. And you went through a lot of turmoil then because you didn't know. Yes, I mean, I had never been subjected to something called curfew. Uh, well, uh, actually, we had. In Washington, D.C., Mayor <laughs> Kelly subjected us. Uh, well, uh, were you here in 68 when they had the No, not 68, uh, but I was here for the Kelly thing. Adams, Adams Morgan? On the we Morgan, had a one-day curfew. We never took that seriously. In fact, we thought it was a party. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, me and, and a whole bunch of my friends got a, got a case of beer or something and we uh, holed up all night and we talked and drank and we never took it seriously. But when you say curfew right. in Palestine, you you're talking about a foreign Absolutely. military occupation, soldiers with Uzis and guns and, and uh, canisters. Uh, and, and bombs and, and, and uh, personnel carriers and stuff like that. And it's scary. When King was killed. Is that right, 68? The troops I read about the National Guard and Indeed, I read about it. People up with their and indeed. Curfews. I've seen pictures of that. I've seen documentaries yeah. about it. Yes, indeed. Yeah. But yeah. In the West Bank and Gaza, and possibly in Israel, I don't know about Israel, this is a daily occurrence. Yeah. By yes, sundown, sir. you're off the road, you're off the streets, you're squirreled away mm -hmm. in your house, mm -hmm. or your, your life is in danger, seriously. That is Legally true. so. And if you are caught, either by the uh, uh, by soldiers or by the brutal border police uh, after hours, man, nobody's going to hear uh, from you or about you for a long time. Yeah, it's uh, and it happens all the time. It happens without warning. Israelis will say. They will uh, be marching, uh, they'll be driving down the streets with their bullhorns. All right, curfew is on tonight at 6 o'clock. And people are scurrying around like rats. Yeah. Excuse me. They're trying to buy groceries. Sure. And the curfew could go on from anything like, from like 24 hours to 24 days. Yes, sir. But you know, it's great. Curfews have become, ironically enough, curfews have become a kind of time for bonding. You know, people living in, let's say, a high-rise apartment, and we're talking about, let's say, 50 families or something, and be, the doors are open, you know, all the doors are open, people are wandering in and out, sharing food, and they come in and see you, hi, Abu Ali, do you have enough bread? Oh, no, I'm short of bread here, but I need some onions, you know what I'm saying? People are bonding big time, sharing, talking, and dig this, man. They are dancing, and they are singing. Yes. And I was in that curfew for three days in Ramallah that uh, Habib was talking about, man. And I thought it was like the most uh, beautiful uh, three days that I had spent anywhere, you know? Uh, uh, I, people were dancing all the time, moving in and out of people's like different apartments, kids, you know what I'm saying? Da when I'm, talk I'm talking about dancing like the folk, uh, folk uh, circle uh, dancing, you know, the dabki, okay? And uh, uh, so it's like, in other words, they are saying to the Israelis outside, the oppressors, go fuck yourself.
You know what I'm saying? We don't care. I mean, literally, this is, in effect, what... Uh, you'll edit this out, won't you? <laughs> uh, uh, what, uh, this, in effect, is what the, um, uh, the Palestinians on the curfew are saying. We will not be cowed. I mean, the fact that these people have retained their sanity after a quarter century of occupation must attest to the uh, resilience, or some kind of resilience, that this society has. And the fact that these people, after like 20 years of occupation, still came back with, a, with a, an uprising, uh, intifada, a word that has become naturalized by the entire planet, attests to the fact that these people will not be uh, cowed. And I don't think they are going to be cowed by Yasser Arafat either, who is now serving the interests of the Israeli uh, uh, occupation. See, what I'm suggesting to you the reason that a great many of us, Palestinian Democrats, writers, poets, activists, dismiss this so-called peace agreement is because we think it's a trick. But it's more than a trick. It's more sinister than just a trick. What this agreement is, this harks back to the process of decolonization in the 40s and 50s when the British and the French we're granting. You remember the term they used to use? We are granting the Algerians independence, you know? Uh, the, the process of decolonization essentially is the British would move out of India or move out of Nigeria or whatever huh? and say, well, we are granting independence to the Nigerian people. But in this um, egregious, uh, sinister process, they leave behind, they leave behind a leadership elite that is subservient to them and is guaranteed to serve their interests forevermore. In other words, uh, this leadership elite will, will be in power hmm, to continue the process of uh, colonization, except in this case the colonizers are not physically in the country. In other words, the colonizers, in this case the British, will continue to exploit, uh, uh, exploit the labor and the resources of Nigeria without them actually being there uh, to, to, to do it themselves. So this is what's been happening in the second, this is the history of the second half of the 20th century, my friends. This is named the struggle of indigenous people, the struggle of oppressed peoples who had been formerly colonized, struggling against indigenous elites who are serving the interests of the former colonizers. And this is what Yasser Arafat and the PLO that has been totally corrupted and totally uh, bought by the Israelis and Washington. Sold out. Sold out indeed. Thank you. That sums it up for me. Well, you take Hamas, who was started by the Israelis themselves, and now Hamas has turned on their initial benefactors. Uh, let me correct you, Charles. Uh, Hamas was not started by the Israelis. Hamas was started well, independently. Uh, let me continue. Hamas was started independently of the Israelis, but the Israelis actually turned a, a kind of blind eye uh, to the existence of Hamas because they thought, I'm talking about the uh, uh, 80s, huh? middle 80s, right, right. okay? Because they thought that the existence of Hamas would act to block or to impede or to confuse uh, the work of the PLO. But of course, Hamas is, uh, regardless of what you believe, uh, about them, regardless of uh, uh, what their convictions are, you know, whether you believe in them or not. Uh, this is a group that I take very seriously. This is a group that has grown organically from the malaise, the oppression, the suffering of the Palestinian people. Above all, Hamas has grown uh, uh, as a response to the corruption, ineptitude, and cynicism of the PLO. I'm talking about PLO officialdom, PLO officialdom, uh, it's PLO officials. I have seen them with my eye. I was myself very close to the PLO. I'm close, I used to be close to Yasser Arafat and all, the, uh, all his uh, henchmen. Uh, I have seen them with my own eyes, traveling on the Concord with Samsonites full of cash. This is our money, the people's money. This money was given to the PLO uh, by uh, the, um, uh, the Saudis and uh, in those days Kuwaitis and so on and so forth, plus money given to the PLO by Palestinian expatriate workers hmm, to be held in trust by the PLO to be dispersed fairly, justly to the Palestinian people. No, 
this, this money became the possession of PLO officialdom, and you see them to this day. They're living in million dollar homes, and they don't. That is, in Arabic, what I said was, and they don't give a good goddamn about the fate of their people. You know, you see them today. They're living right here in McLean, Virginia, or whatever. Uh, yes, Mohammed? Yeah, I'll ask you a more general question that has to do with this, uh, the call of Sahwa Dini or the call of fundamentalism, Islamic fundamentalism in the Arab world, or the word fundamentalism. Is, you know, I can't find a, an equivalent to Sahwa in English, maybe revival. Uh, is there any relation? Revival? Awakening? Awakening, yeah. Yeah, well, maybe awakening okay. Better, yeah. But anyway, is there any relationship between it and, and the speeding up of the, of the, uh, the peace process? I, it seems to me that there was some rush, you know, to, to have some peace between the Arabs in general and Palestinians in particular and the Israelis as soon as possible because of this huge movement that is sweeping the whole Arab world. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I, that's, I think that's a very interesting question. First of all, by the way, let's uh, guard against using the term Islamic fundamentalists. Yeah. There's no such thing as Islamic fundamentalism. Fundamentalism is a function of the evolution of Christianity, not Islam. You know, I say Islamic activist or Islamic uh, theoretician or ideologue or uh, fighter or whatever, but I never speak of an Islamic uh, uh, fundamentalist. You can even say an Islamic uh, uh, absolutist even, I would go along with that, but you could never say an Islamic fundamentalist. Fundamentalism, as I was saying, is a function of the evolution of Christianity as a religion and as a uh, social ideology, you know. Now, yes, I, uh, I have a suspicion that, in fact, the speeding up uh, of uh, the peace process was uh, a consequence of the concern by the Israelis and by the Arab leadership elite and by Washington uh, that uh, the, revi the awa Islamic awakening in the Arab world uh, was, in fact, on the march. And unless uh, a settlement was reached uh, as soon as possible, uh, that this would create a vacuum huh? uh, that would be filled by uh, the, the, this uh, Islamic movement. Uh, this is why we see today uh, the unbelievable spectacle of the Israeli government, Israeli army, Israeli intelligence trying to protect uh, the life of Yasser Arafat. I mean, I'm talking about the BLO, a group. There are those who think that he may not be protected by the Israelis very long. In fact, uh, 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 well, the old chemistry professor at I'm Hebrew nice. University, you know, I mean, I, Shah. he says Rabin is about to serve up uh, Arafat's head on a silver platter if, uh, I mean, this will, he will use it an excuse the, uh, 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 the, what Hamas has been doing to, to have Yasser Arafat taken out. Yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah, well, you see, the Israelis win either way. Yeah. If the Palestinians assassinate him, fine. Uh, and if not, uh, he'll discredit himself. But the Palestinian people will be divided into sure. Bantustan's reservations, and their cause will be squandered and frittered away. Who will come? Who will take his place? In case in uh, uh, who will take his place? You know, I uh, I'm quite convinced uh, that uh, the Islamic awakening, to use your uh, uh, translation of the term. Uh, is a movement all over the Arab world that should indeed be taken very seriously. Uh, you see, this is a movement, the awakening, or the renaissance uh, of Islamic activism, revivalism, uh, occurred uh, or began to emerge, uh, possibly, um, <coughs> if you want to take a point of departure, I would say 1967, after the uh, June War. That is because uh, up till uh, the June War, sometimes known as the Six-Day War, uh, the Arab masses had actually put all their eggs in the nationalist basket. Okay, they had believed in Basism, uh, Pan-Arabism, uh, Nasserism, um, um, anemic uh, Bolshevik style uh, communism, that kind of thing. In other words, they believed in secular ideologies. They really believed that these ideologies, or one of them, or all of them, that somehow gelled as a, as a nationalist ideology, will ultimately uh, succeed in bringing about social justice and freedom in the Arab world and the liberation of Palestine. 
But by 1967, when the Arab armies had collapsed in a big heap, huh? <laughs> when they had collapsed in a big heap in, they say six days, actually I think it was six hours, this <laughs> came as an incredible shock. And in a way, whether consciously or teleologically or unconsciously, the Arab masses began, in effect, to say, we have been betrayed by these ideologies. And they began, unconsciously, if you wish, and that's how it often happens, uh, a kind of movement uh, toward the one social ideology that the Arab masses, strangely enough, had not embraced for a long, long time. The one ideology that grew out of the very bosom of their history, which was Islam. You know? And I see Islam as, uh, as the wave of the future. Islam, not necessarily as a ritual religion, but indeed Islam as a social ideology, you know what I'm saying, uh, that uh, will um, uh, keep in mind, by the way, I'm interrupting myself here and digressing a little bit. Keep in mind that Islam, like any social ideology, like Christianity or whatever, uh, is responsive to authoritarianism or responsive to democracy. It depends on how you interpret Islam. Some Muslims uh, are reactionary and they would interpret Islam in a reactionary manner. Some, so, uh, when we speak of the Islamic uh, awakening or revival in the Arab world, we have to keep in mind that there are many Islamic movements in the Arab world. Some of which are indeed liberal. I'm not using the word liberal in a sort of John Lockean uh, sense here, but liberal in the sense of not being reactionary. Uh, and uh, others are uh, sort of um, uh, concerned with uh, petty Mickey Mouse uh, things like uh, should women be allowed uh, to have their hair cut uh, in a hair salon by, by a man, you know, or something like that, you know. So, uh, but come what may, I am convinced that in this vacuum that occurs in the Arab world, in the absence of social justice and freedom and democracy uh, and a voice uh, for the masses, I think this uh, movement will, uh, will in fact take place. And it will come back, it will come back and do exactly what the uh, Iranians did. It will become very anti-American, very anti-imperialist, you know? Because to go back to what you said earlier, before the reading started, uh, uh, Washington has historically uh, acquired friends in the third world. And who are these friends? These friends essentially were the indigenous elite that served uh, the interests of American imperialism in that part of the world. And so, when they thought of Iran, what is Iran? Iran was what the Shah thought. What is uh, Nicaragua? What Somoza thought. What is Egypt? What Sadat thought. And there came a time when the masses, as often happened, as always happens, swept away these flunkies, you know, and threw them down the dustbin of history. Because I happen to believe that in the end, in the end, in the historical process, in, in human existence, human beings do make a difference. Human beings do make a difference. Human beings do make history. You know, it is not, uh, this is not a one-man show. You know, what is happening all over the Arab world, in Africa, in no, including North Africa, in the Middle East, uh, in, in Southeast Asia, uh, in, uh, in the Indian subcontinent, and in South America, what is happening is an attempt by the peoples of these so-called underdeveloped countries to get rid of indigenous overlords that were left behind by or that were propped up by uh, imperialists or former colonial overlords. This is the most salient struggle, if you want to sum it up, uh, in a few words, this is really what has characterized the struggle of uh, peoples in the third world this entire century. And the ironic part of it all is that there has not been a single national struggle in the first and the second half of the 20th century by oppressed peoples that had not been accompanied by violence. Vietnamese fought against the French and the, and the, uh, and the Americans because the French and the Americans wanted to put puppets in Saigon. 
and the people in in Central and South America are fighting against uh, uh, against totalitarian regimes and dictators, uh, and they are dying for their cause because uh, they are trying to get rid of these puppets that Washington or in those days London and Paris propped up. This is essentially what it's all about. And so long as Washington continues uh, to um, uh, define the uh, political ethos of a society uh, through the court. Uh, Fawaz Turkey is one of the most uh, interesting and illuminating of the Palestinian writers and uh, it was our privilege to have him here this evening for our program Mideast Realities. Um, please tune in next week on this channel at the same time for another, uh, another Mideast Realities. Yeah. 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 Yeah.